You know, there's that film, Citizen Kane, and at the end, he says, yeah, absolutely, Rosebud, he says. Um, uh, so it's got, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot going for us just because of that movie. Um, I'm going to paint a picture uh, uh, for you about a day in the life of Rosebud, and it's going to be a picture that is this coming Saturday. And if you're uh, quick enough, you can get tickets and be part of the picture. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, well, I'm actually not kidding, but uh, I'm going to paint, paint a picture of uh, this coming Saturday in Rosebud and, uh, and weave through what I think is uh, part of what makes us tick and what makes that community work. And then I'll go on. We'll talk about some, some other things like uh, the spin-offs from all of this. But um, it's 8.30 a.m. on June 24th, 2017 in Rosebud, Alberta, and I thought the population was 88. The morning sun shines on a picturesque valley with an old, odd collection of buildings, old and new, some repurposed, some specifically built for purpose. Steel quonsets beside renovated bed and breakfast cottages. An old historic hotel gleams white. A couple walks our dog past the Opera House, then the Thorny Rose Cafe. They, uh, for a, they, they pause for a moment to look out across a wild, untamed valley rimmed by farmer's fields. The air is full of the sound of early morning songbirds. They ponder following a path down into the valley where a perfect oval surrounds a pond. A plaque tells them that the old racetrack that was a going concern in the 1920s when 300 residents cut loose on the weekends with dances, small town shenanigans, and car races met there in that to race their cars. They are greeted by an actress they saw in last evening's performance out in her front garden collecting herbs for breakfast. She and her husband, both performers in the present production, operate the actor's studio bed and breakfast. This morning's breakfast table is sure to be filled with conversation about last night's performance. They're greeted by an actress they saw, oh, um, uh, I've said that. A farm truck drives through the middle of the conversation. Everyone pauses to wave. Jim Martin lives up the valley a half mile or so and provides organic produce and fresh meat to those in town who like to have their food locally grown. Some of that produce will be on the table at the actor's studio B&B. &B. A bicycle whizzes by. Bill Hamm, the music director of the present production, is on his way to meet a student of Rosebud School of the Arts over at a small, renovated granary, now a vocal studio. He's coaching, singing for a final project that is part of the student's graduation requirement. Self-produced, money-managed, marketed, and artistically vital student final projects are the climax of a student's practice in the school. Entrepreneurial art making is a significant part of artist training in Rosebud. The business of show business is a toolkit young artists will carry with them as they set off to make their way in the world. In the Haskane Kenny Mercantile, named after Dick and Lois Haskane, and I'll tell you about them in just a moment. Kitchen preparations are underway for the buffet, which serves 220 people twice on a two-show day in a town of 88, or 97, or 100. <laughs> the, or the original building was built in 1918 and renovated for use by the Rosebud School of the Arts in the early 80s. In 2011, a significant corner block addition was added with a state-of-the-art kitchen, additional dining space, conference rooms, conference, front, conference rooms, studio and classroom space, and, uh, and, uh, and also ticket uh, selling and lobby and, oh, a, a new craft shop. Um, and it was actually in 2014, Dick and Ho Lois Haskane paid off the million dollar mortgage that was left on that building. Why? Because they love young people? And because Lois Haskane used to walk down the railway tracks on her way to school in Rosebud from nearby Redland. 
And she, so she has a special place in her heart for this little village that was her home and where she played the piano on Sunday mornings in church. It also houses a restaurant called Wild Horse Jack's, named for a rancher in the area, best known for initiating the chuck wagon races and the pancake breakfast at the internationally renowned Calgary Stampede. He is also known locally for holding up a church service because parishioners weren't putting enough into the offering plate to cover the traveling preacher's costs. The spirit of generosity suddenly descended, prompted by the presence of a six-shooter. <laughs> Apparently, Pierre Burton opened one of his many books about frontier Canada with that very story. Nowadays, such events only happen on the stage with no danger of stray bullets. Okay, I'm embellishing, Jack never actually shot the gun. But, uh, but this is the theater, so <laughs> stories develop out of stories, out of stories, out of stories. And 20 years from now, he will in fact have not only um, uh, held that place up, but he will have put a bullet through a Bible somehow. And that'll be part of the story, because mythology is what we're all about, yes? By 11 a.m., the streets begin to fill with cars, people coming early to visit the Okokonisque Art Gallery, itself a repurposed church with a fully operational recording studio in the basement. They wander along the tracks. They shop in a handful of boutique stores. The Kithen Kiln happens to be owned and operated by an actor who stars in the performance patrons are about to see. An actor has to make a living, after all. And between operating a gift shop, guest appearances on the TV series Heartland, renovating and repurposing old bu buildings, performing in the Wheatland Band, and acting on the Opera House stage, Travis Friesen keeps the wolves at the door and lives a lifestyle many might envy. It is now 12.30 p.m. And guests are eating their fill at the buffet, accompanied by a musical trio of Rosebud School of the Arts students themselves promising actor-musicians, providing lunch and dinner entertainment. Then, well-fed patrons cross the street to the Opera House to take in a performance of this summer's musical, The Spitfire Grill. Coincidentally, the story of a dying town brought back from extinction by a newspaper-advertised raffle to own the grill in town. The aging matriarch who owns the Spitfire can't sell it. There's no industry in town since the quarry shut down. She has no money for retirement. So a young parolee who lands in town because she wants to leave her past behind and start over again suggests a raffle. A hundred dollars in the best description gets the grill. An overwhelming number of letters come from across the country putting into words the kind of life people long for in a village where they can start over again. The letters are extensions of human hearts looking for family, friendship, respite, a life that's slow enough so that one can actually live it. And we've had a bunch of stories like that in the last two days. It's remarkable to me. On stage at 1.30 p.m., the associate first cellist from the Quebec Symphony Orchestra pulls a sublime musical phrase from her instrument and the audience leans forward, prepared to let the music take them to whatever place it wishes, secretly hoping it might make them cry as well as laugh. The cellist joins other guest artists and resident company performers employed by Rosebud Theater to present this story about starting over again in a small town. The design team who imagined the world patrons see on stage is made up of artists from Vancouver and Edmonton. A prominent Calgary actress plays Hannah, the elderly woman at the center of the story. Several years ago, this actor, who has performed on stages across the country, made it her goal to work for Rosebud Theatre. And here she is, pouring her heart out in story and music that taps into a deep longing in her own heart. It's an emotional performance. The question some might ask after the show is, was she acting or was that real? And I'd venture to say, because I know that it's real. Because of what it calls for deep inside of her. The show ends with a standing ovation. People have indeed cried as well as laughed. 
and it feels good to have done so. There's no better therapy than good old-fashioned emotional storytelling. They leave the theater uplifted and hopeful, and they're in a village of 88 people. The story experience is complete. It's authentic and real. Places like Gilead in the musical exist. They're standing in the middle of one. They're standing at the four-way stop in Ro one, one four-way stop. They're standing at the four-way stop in Rosebud, waiting for a truck driver who's, uh, a truck whose driver has paused to talk to the mercantile chef to move through. People stop at the stop sign, and they don't move. And it's real. They're on their way to the Rosebud Country Inn to have afternoon pie baked by a local pie maker. They've heard via the grapevine you can't leave without having a piece of BJ's pie. They've had a hard time deciding whether they should have an ice cream at the stand outside the theater or go for pie. You see, the stand is owned and operated by a couple of actors in town, one of whom is in the next show. The artist entrepreneurs who own the ice cream stand also operate a honey business housed in a large open suitcase outside the opera house. The business operates on trust. Put your money in the open cash box and take your jar of honey. They've only had one jar of honey taken without payment in two years. It seems that trust inspires honesty. Who'd have thought? By the way, there are a host of beekeepers in town. It's not uncommon to have a conversation with a swollen-eyed villager whose face exhibits the commitment of the beekeeping adventure. It all started when a retired John Morschbacher and his wife took over the Thorny Rose Cafe and taught everyone the art of beekeeping. And now it's a big event every spring when uh, all the bees come in because you lose some hives over the, over the winter. And it's a big deal. All of a sudden, everybody's a beekeeper. At the end of the day, on June 24th, the village of 88 souls called Rosebud will have fed, entertained, and inspired 440 people. 220 will come out of the evening show to a starlit sky they rarely ever see. They'll walk to their B&Bs with the sound of a chorus of frogs accompanying them and be woken a bit too early the next day by songbirds outside their open window. Those that don't stay the night will drive home under that same starlit sky and they'll ponder the richness of their lives in a spirit of gratefulness. They'll entertain an optimism about human beings that may well have eroded over the course of their busy lives and the pilgrimage to a place called Rosebud will have been nourishment for their souls. So, how did it all start? There's a little ad, if you will. How did it all start? Here's a brief history. Blackfoot peoples winter camped in the Rosebud Valley long before settlers came to the area. Their teepee rings still remain. The Blackfoot called the valley a Coconisque, which means by the river of many roses. The hamlet itself was founded in 1885 by James Wishart. While following the Galician Trail to Montana with his family, they awoke to the river valley covered by wild roses. And he said, here's the promised land. We don't go any further. His great-grandson occasionally comes to the theater and has written a book about the area. And his grandson is my brother's best friend. All roads leads to Rosebud, it would seem. Sam, here's one, Sam McGee. The person whose name was used by Robert's service in his poem, The Cremation of Sam McGee, is buried in a cemetery along the Rosebud River. In 1944, members of the Group of Seven made the valley the subject of their paintings. And then, here's how it started in terms of Rosebud School of the Arts and the theater. On Easter weekend, 1973, Laverne Erickson, a youth pastor in Calgary, decided to take a bunch of kids out for the week to have an arts camp. And 40 of them camped out in the old mercantile which was abandoned, and I now refer to them as the group of 40, because they followed the group of seven, and they painted too. 
Um, and uh, and uh, uh, that began the whole Rosebud adventure in terms of its development into a school and a theater and everything else. In 1977, a high school was founded using the old buildings of the town as classrooms and emphasizing the performing arts in its curriculum. In 1986, Rosebud School of the Arts evolved into a post-secondary school. This is all Laverne Erickson. He just kept going, well, let's do this, and let's do that. And uh, they did it. It's, it's extraordinary. It's like, it, 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 um, it, it, uh, it supports a lot of the stories that have come out of uh, previous uh, speakers here. And then in 1988, the Alberta legislature passed the Rosebud School of the Arts Act, creating a unique arts guild school modeled after the European tradition of guild school training in the arts. As part of Rosebud's centenary in 1983, the school's drama department launched the Rosebud Historic Musical Theater. Staff and students wrote the play, rehearsed it, and performed it on an outdoor stage, drawing hundreds of interested theater goers. They ate a potluck dinner under a canvas canopy, then took in the play. Thus began the widely acclaimed Rosebud Theater, which attracts, and we've attracted up to 41,000 people a year in the really high years. The old community hall, originally a grain storage facility, was then renovated into a 220 seat theater called the Opera House. Rosebud Theater now stages up to seven professional plays a year, five at the Opera House and two on the BMO studio stage, a 70-seat black box theater in the west end of Rosebud. Matinee and evening shows are offered up to seven times a week. And in addition to these, this programming, um, the school, Rosebud School of the Arts, uh, mounts two productions a year, a dance show, um, there are at least three student final projects a year. So when you, when you put them all together, on average, there are 13 events happening year-round in this town of 88 people um, and performing arts events. Patrons of the theater come from all over Alberta and during the summer, tourists from across the, the globe. Why do they come? They come for respite from the day-to-day -day of their lives, they come to meet friends and family in a scenic environment that prepares their spirits for good food and performances that are entertaining, soulful, and uplifting. I believe they also come because of the connection and conversation they have with each other and with the artists who they have come to know. The performers are accessible. Patrons are likely to meet and talk to them in the street. Conversations about a given play with the artists involved round out the richness and the entertainment experience. That level of engagement, folks, creates a trust between patron and artist that is not unlike the trust between a local butcher and the community residents that, that frequents their establishment. A person could trust the cut of meat for your daughter's engagement party because you know the person preparing the meat. Ongoing relationship builds trust, promise, and accountability. Nathan Schmidt, who uh, runs that actor studio B&B, would never betray my trust because I know him. And I know him not just because I've stayed in his B&B, because I've seen him on stage over and over again, and I love him. And he has been hospitable and gracious to me too, and so, if I have a problem with a play, I can talk to Nathan Schmidt because I know him. I do believe that is the element that lies at the core of the Rosebud experience. It is an intangible that fires the economic engine of the place. We live in a culture where we don't know our neighbors. Many, many of us live far from our extended family we can feel isolated in the midst of a host of neighbors. And human beings are at our core social beings. We long for authentic, meaningful experiences we share with others. We want to escape the pessimism of our Facebook feeds. We want to find some faith in our common humanity. And for the same reason that people make their way west to the Rocky Mountains on any given weekend to commune with each other in nature, 
They also wander east into rural landscapes where food is grown and harvested, where people say exactly what they mean, to small towns where everybody knows each other. We long to know the name of the person who grows and harvests our food, handcrafts the new wallet we give to our father on his 70th birthday, creates the painting we give to our beloveds on their wedding day, makes the unique micro beer we drink, writes the songs we listen to, the books we read, the plays we attend. We long for the imprint of the maker's hand to be known and accessible to us. Rosebud is a theater town where you know the artists and they're likely to know you by name. I'll say this, Rosebud is a company town. The only industry, folks, is theater and the teaching of the craft of the theater. And up around that industry, if you will, up around that has, has grown these things. Nine bed and breakfasts within a 20 kilometer radius of Rosebud. Four eating establishments, not counting the Rosebud Mercantile Buffet, which is part of the price of a theater ticket. Three boutique craft shops, a fully equipped recording studio. This isn't accurate, probably. I, I phoned to find out, but about 45 room rentals for Rosebud School of the Arts students and guest artists. And I should say that one of the things that's unique about the educational experience is that there is no dormitory. There is no, uh, it's like your, your, your town uh, where the school is the town. And the energy of the town is the fact that people are, are, are student, young people are, are zipping down, sometimes in, in uh, crazy looking uh, uh, clothes. Um, and they're, they're whizzing down past patrons to go to a class over here, and it's just, it just bustles, and you go, 88 people. And it's bustling with life. And part of the magic is the fact that those students don't live in a dormitory. They live in basement suites. One of those basement suites is in the same house as the Actors Studio and B&B. So you come to that place, and you, and you stay upstairs um, as a patron in the B&B, you talk with the actor, uh, two of the actors who own the place on the main floor, and below them in the basement suite are three students of Rosebud School of the Arts, some, of who, may, some who may be involved in the production in some way. And there is a, 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 a revolving of life in the place that goes from young to old. And uh, it is part of the magic. And in fact, some time ago, the, there, was, there was always a, a concern at, at the board level that we wouldn't have enough space for our students. We have about 35 students a year, and we kind of cap out at 40. We're, we're equipped for 40. And so there was a concern, should we, have, should we build a dormitory? And, and uh, there was a lot of resistance on the part of staff about that idea, partly because for the student to be a part of, uh, to live in their mentor's basement suite, means that conversations happen late at night that are all about life and living in this business and how to carry your way through it. So, and, and partly, when you think of Nathan Schmidt owning this house, he's an actor. Doesn't make a lot of money. All of a sudden, it was viable for him to build a house. There's rentals in the basement, there's a home to live on the main floor, and there's a B&B &B upstairs. And a natural evolution happened that seems to keep caught up. I'm, we're kind of aston astonished that every year we worry a little bit about where are we gonna put these students up? Where are we gonna put these students up? And it just so happens that somebody else has built another house in town and there's a few more rooms to rent, yes? Um, uh, there's a golf course. There's another 10 or more rooms uh, uh, in a brand new, pretty posh looking B&B &B just across the tracks. Um, that's coming on board. There are two campgrounds, um, uh, and, and there's, are, there are two chunks of land which are actually slotted for housing development and waiting lists to actually purchase that land. Um, we have a chamber music festival that happens during the summer where artists from, uh, chamber artists from uh, Canadian Opera Company, et cetera, come out just to make music in the Rosebud Valley. 
and uh, 15 Minutes of Fame Folk Musical Festival, which is a one-day festival in the fall. And those two things we don't manage. They just happened. Um, so that's Rosebud. I'll finish by saying our currency is relationship and belonging. We endeavor to model and articulate the idea of authentic community. Ours is not a theme town. The architecture expresses utilitarian pragmatism as much as historic charm. My favorite building is an old Quonset steel building. It's got these big old Manitoba maples growing around it. Every yard is not a well manicured cured garden. People wander down the street past a front yard populated by model railway trains to a front yard that looks more like a daycare than a home residence in a tourist destination town to a wooded yard surrounding a rustic looking two-story home one would expect to see in the interior of British Columbia and then on to a, a manicured flower front yard. What you see is who we are and that is true of our theatrical offerings our food and our, and our hospitality, and that's what makes the Rosebud experience, I think, <coughs> as popular as it is, authenticity. Um, I, uh, I think my time is up, probably. Yeah. <laughs>